Hey there everybody and welcome back to the channel. This is the second in my two-part special on the Battle of Waterloo and the Hundred Days campaign. And this one is going to be focusing on how it is the worst thing to happen to Napoleonic Wargaming. Now I'm going to say, <laughs> I should say right off the bat, it's slightly tongue-in-cheek. Although there are some points, I, I, I hope they're going to be valid points that I raise here. This channel always tries to be positive because you know, we have enough difficulty getting people attracted to this hobby as it is. So I'm not, if you want to do the Waterloo campaign, then you do the Waterloo campaign. Don't let me persuade you different. Don't let anyone else persuade you different. If the Waterloo campaign is your bag, baby, then you fill your boots. There's absolutely no problem with it. This is going to be a slightly tongue-in-cheek video. And I'm going to be looking at maybe, hopefully, pointing out ways that if you are only interested in the Napoleonic, uh, in the uh, Waterloo campaign, sorry, that maybe you can expand your horizons and look at some other sub-periods, I'm going to call them, or periods, of the wars and maybe extend your, your knowledge and your enjoyment of the period. I said in the last video that Waterloo shines like a supernova in the night sky, and that is a major, major problem, in my opinion, because it drowns out the light of all the other stars in the surrounding area or the other campaigns in this uh, in this analogy i guess you could say so many of you will know many long time listeners will know that my favorite campaign in the polyonic wars is the 1809 danube campaign the reason for that is because you've got napoleon just coming down from the height of his powers you've got a rising austria which never quite reached the six levels of success it could have done they clash against each other you've got napoleon's first defeat in that campaign and you've also got him coming back for a mighty victory at Vagram as well. So for my money that has as much drama as the 100 days campaign. Arguably more but um, po po probably not. I probably wouldn't argue it's more dramatic than the 100 days. But there is plenty of drama in there. But because people associate Napoleonics with Waterloo, these these side campaigns, I guess you could call them, it's not really a side campaign, but these lesser known campaigns get rather the short end of the stick. And I think one of the main reasons why they're lesser well-known... Now, I'm talking here as someone who is English, British, and I only really speak English. I can speak, as, as you will know if you've heard the pronunciations on this channel, I can speak a tiny amount of French very, very badly. So, uh, so that's that may be more me than anything else, but... The sources for the battles that involve non-British armies, so something like the Danube campaign, are far more scarce than they are for Waterloo. I could probably find uh, more books on a single aspect of the Battle of Waterloo in English than I can on the entire Danube campaign. So it could be, and this is something that I'd be really interested to hear from my European or foreign-speaking listeners, do you have this problem in your countries as well? Does Waterloo really sh outshine all of the, and I'm going to use this term in inverted commas, all the local campaigns that happened? Or is it just because I'm an, you know, I'm Anglo, is it just because of my Anglo-centric worldview? That'd be really interesting to hear. I do hope that there are more foreign language books about their respective campaigns. Speaking of Napoleon coming down off his peak, that's another problem I have with the Battle of Waterloo. Napoleon is pretty poor by that stage of his career. Not only is Napoleon pretty poor, Ney is absolutely dreadful. On a recent live stream, uh, someone asked me what happened with Ney at the Battle of Waterloo, and I said then, and I, I do maintain, I actually think his experience in Russia broke him. I think mentally he wasn't the man who he was in 1805, or maybe even 1809, or certainly 1811. And the problem I have with Waterloo from looking at it from the French perspective is these are guys who are very much off their game. If you if all you knew about Wellington, uh, sorry, if all you knew about Napoleon was the Battle of Waterloo, you'd be like, well, what's all the fuss about? He got, he lost. He did some stupid moves, and he got beat by the Duke of Wellington uh, and the Prussians, of course. Let's not forget the Prussians. But he got beaten. I, I don't understand why he's so great. But it's when you study his earlier battles, his battles such as Austerlitz, that or his campaign in 1806. It's when you study these that you really come across Napoleon's true genius. If all you know is his loss, then you're rather diminishing the the genius that Napoleon was. Similarly, his army was pretty piss poor. He had a brigade of... Sorry, no, he had a division of hardened Peninsula War veterans. But everything else... And the guard were maybe pretty good, the old guard. 
everything else, mm, yeah, suspect. I think you could uh, you could you could say with a little bit of giving the French the benefit of the doubt. I think, as I often say about my early painting, more enthusiasm than skill. Now that said, that's what got the French army to the successes that they had in the Revolutionary Wars. So it was a potential recipe for success. However, the other armies, the British and the Prussians, particularly the Prussians, they had undergone their reforging in the fire of the Napoleonic Wars. And the Prussian army of 1815 wasn't going to be beaten like the Prussian army at Valmy was in the 18, sorry, in the 1790s. When they came on in 1815, good lord, they came on. And a Phrygian cap and a shout of Viva the Republic wasn't quite going to cut it in what became very early modern warfare, I believe, in 1815. Speaking of early modern warfare, the, the Napoleonic Wars by 1815 were a very different beast to what they had been only five or six years earlier. When you look at, for argument's sake, I'll compare it with the defeat of the Prussians in 1806. So when the Prussians were defeated in 1806, they had a peace treaty, they had a sit-down, uh, the Battle of Tilsit, a couple of years, uh, the uh, Treaty of Tilsit, sorry, not the Battle of Tilsit, the Treaty of Tilsit, a couple of years later, and, you know, they, they lost some territory to Poland, and, you know, that was pretty much it. You know, the king was still the king, the queen was still the queen, and Prussia still existed. But in 1815, the Prussians had spent a year basically occupying Paris and trying to blow up various parts of it. They were very unpopular, so these guys, when they were... When you were fighting these modern 1815 wars, it wasn't like the old school. It wasn't like the, the Seven Years' War, where, you know, you just have a treaty and swap some lands over. These were wars of existential survival. Which means that, for me, a lot of the dash and daring has gone. When you're playing for those high stakes, you can't afford the figures like La Salle or Murat or these people. You know, they've gone. The... the the technocrats are back. You know, the, the men who are the professionals, this is all about them. And that's one of the great things about the Napoleonic period for me, is it's full of those characters. Those people who, you know, they are professionals, but they're not the dyed-in-the-wool professionals that would come to dominate militaries in the future. I mean, look at someone like, for argument's sake, Sir Douglas Haig, the commander-in-chief of the British during the First World War. He was a cavalry commander. Compare him to the Earl of Uxbridge, you know, by God, sir, I've lost my leg. By God, sir, so you have. You know, that kind of stuff. Riding around in his Busby and his Hussars uniform. You know, there's a whole different style of person there, isn't there? And I think that by 1815, the the dash and the romance of the Napoleonic Wars has probably died in the snows of Russia. I often say that the age of romantic warfare... And again, I know I keep saying this, but... <laughs> war isn't romantic being blown up by cannons and shot and sabred and stuff like that it, it's really unpleasant don't get me wrong it is super unpleasant but looking back 200 years we can we can look in the reflected romance of it and i often say that the romance of the napoleonic wars died with la salle at the end of that grenade that austrian grenadier's bullet and I think that's it's a nice line for me. It's a nice bit of hyperbole, but really, I think it was by 1812 warfare had changed. Warfare had become total war, and it, it, when, when you when you're playing for higher stakes, the fun and the excitement for me anyway goes out of it. And the Waterloo campaign, you're playing for the highest stakes possible. I think the Prussians, of course, after the battle, they were quite keen to execute Napoleon, but the British were having none of it, and we exiled him to the South Atlantic. Now, this is a rather personal thing of mine, but I, I think it's going to resonate with a few people. The armies of 1815, as well as not being highly trained, certainly from the French perspective, are just really boring. I mean, they're just so boring. I said in one of the reasons why Waterloo is such a great game is because you've got such a varied army. And that's true, particularly for the Allies. But for the French, oh, it's just so dull. I mean, where are the Bavarians? Where are the Poles? Where are the Italians? Where are the Portuguese Legion or the Piedmontese Legion? Where are my Swiss? Actually, there were Italian Swiss there. But where are the rest of the Swiss? I don't have the Lancers of Berg in their baby pink uniforms. They weren't really that pink, but they were pretty pink. Or where are my Saxon Guard de Corps? Instead, I've got, oh, let's paint some French. Oh, cool. Okay, what are you going to paint after your French? Oh, I'm going to paint some more French. Oh. All right, okay. And after you've done them, yeah, I, I, I think I might paint up some French. 
I mean, that's so boring. Get some Italians in there. Get some Swiss. Where are all these foreign units? All these units that, that come together and create the riot of colours that a Napoleonic war game can be. Look at the Battle of Leipzig, the Battle of the Nations, where you've got Prussians, Russians, Austrians, French, everyone all fighting against each other. It's just a, a cacophony of colour. It's a beautiful looking sight. And yet, when you got War 2, you've got, oh, I've got my red guys, I've got my blue guys, and they're fighting each other. Oh, I've got my dark blue guys, they're the Prussians. It's just, it's just so boring. <laughs> no, of course. I'm being, sli I'm, I'm being slightly tongue-in-cheek about this. But there are a, a, like I said, as good as it is for the Allies, there's quite a large variety of units there. For the French, less so. And I think it's one of those things where a French player is more likely, I think, to expand out of the Waterloo campaign. Because, you know, he's going to be like, look, I'm sick of painting bloody Frenchmen. I don't want... I'm sick of painting dark blue and white. I, I want to paint something else. Oh, yeah, who are these guys in their cool green uniforms? Oh, it's the, oh, it's the Irish Legion, or it's the Garde de Paris, or something like this. You know, these really nice, esoteric uniforms. Someone was... Um, we were talking about the Neuchâtel Regiment the other day, which were... They wore orange, you know, stuff like this. You've got all this really nice, wide variety of units out there. For the French player, which you don't really get at Waterloo. And similarly for the Allies as well. There's a lot of really cool units out there that just aren't at the 100 Days campaign. I mean, if you've got an Austrian or a Russian army, they're completely out of the 100 Days campaign. So, even before we go into them. Although I should say, and it's something that I missed off in the good things about uh, the 100 Days campaign, is the British do have the Household Cavalry. Now, the Household Cavalry are very cool. They are iconic. So, it's nice to have them in the battle. They obviously didn't fight in the Peninsula campaign. But yeah, there's there's a real dearth of units out there, different looking troops. I mean, there's no Confederation of the Rhine. I mean, well, there's the Na there's Nassau fighting for the British, but um, yeah, it's, it's just it, it's one of the positives. The brand recognition is it's blue v red. One of the negatives is it's just blue versus just red. Now I know there's obviously more to it than that, but we're, we're talking basic th uh, fifty thousand feet views here. The other thing as well with the brand recognition of Waterloo is because people associate that with Napoleonic Wargaming, every Napoleonic Wargame to the uninitiated becomes, oh, is that Waterloo? You know, well, no, because this one, these are all Russians, so it's obviously not Waterloo. But, you know, they don't know because they've never heard of the Battle of Smolensk or the Battle of the Berezina or something like that, which is which is fair enough. You know, the, the average person isn't going to know that much about Napoleonic Warfare. They probably do know about Waterloo, though, or they know that there was a battle of Waterloo. They may not necessarily know who was there or what it was, but that's their, their touchstone, their reference point to the Napoleonic period. So again, for argument, for, let's say, for instance, you were putting on a battle at the Royal Armouries in Leeds, uh, and a punter who's not a war game, and say, oh, yeah, what are you doing? Are you re and you say, oh, I'm refighting a battle of uh, Napoleon. They might say, oh, is it the Battle of Waterloo? And you're like, well, no, it's it's the Battle of Austerlitz, which was his greatest achievement. They're probably not going to be very interested. And that's one of the problems, again, with the Battle of Waterloo, is it sucks up so much of people's knowledge that it becomes it becomes a little bit of a, of a roadblock for them to get past before they can look at the other stuff. And I would consider, perhaps, the more interesting stuff. Speaking of uh, interesting stuff, and I waxed lyrical a bit ago about the romance of the period being dead. This is where, you know, at Waterloo, you've got some of the great names. My boy Van Damme, he's there. Uh, Ney, obviously. Soult, Napoleon, Wellington, Picton. Some of, the, some of the great main characters are there. Now, one could argue, are they the main characters because they were at Waterloo? But that's a, that's a question for a different day. What I want to talk about here is that there were so many of them missing, though. People like Murat. People like La Salle, Masséna, Kutuzov, Bagration, who I actually think is a rather underrated general. There's no Black Bob Crawford or the Duke of Brunswick. Well, the Duke of Brunswick's a Catrabra, but he's not at Waterloo. These are really fascinating characters who aren't in the Napoleonic story because they weren't at Waterloo. And I think it's a real shame that their stories get lost in the backdraft, lost in the light pollution that comes from the Battle of Waterloo and the Hundred Days campaign. I would say as well with Waterloo as well. For, now, this is a very personal thing, and I think, uh, if I can be serious for a moment here on this uh, this story, uh, or this episode, I really, uh, this is genuinely a personal thing. I am at a stage of my Napoleonic life now, my Napoleonic wargaming career, I guess you could say, that for me, and, and honestly, this is a personal thing, I don't want this to anyone else to feel bad about this. For me, Waterloo is, I've kind of done it. I fought in the great game. I, I, I'm never going to have an experience of the Battle of Waterloo that is that awesome. 
So I went to the 200th anniversary as well. I'm sort of, I'm, I'm kind of done with Waterloo. Uh, now, uh, this is why I'm at, at pains to point out that this is a personal thing for me. If you're not, if that's if this is your entry point into Napoleonic Wargaming, absolutely fill your boots. As I've said all along, this, this video is a bit tongue-in-cheek. The 100 Days campaign is absolutely fascinating. That is why so many people just do the, the 100 Days campaign. They can have massive Napoleonic armies, and all they're interested in is doing the 100 Days. And that's absolutely fine. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, I would actively support people doing that. But for me... I'm kind of done with Waterloo. I, it, I, for me, it's just a little bit boring now. It's been done. It's not going to be done better, uh, in my opinion, than the great game. So let's look at doing something else. One thing I would love to do, there, there's been a lot of talk of a sequel. I'm not sure Tony can... Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure you could quite handle it. And that's no criticism of him. He put in a hell of a lot of effort to get the uh, the other one done. But uh, I'd love to see the Battle of Leipzig. I'd love to see something a little bit different. But... I understand for people, Waterloo is, is it's sort of like I said earlier on, it's a touchstone for them. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The 100 days are very interesting. But for me personally, it's been kind of done. Now, I said in the first part of this video, the why the 100 days campaign is great, that the armies are achievable. You can collect the whole Anglo-Dutch army, because I know someone who has, and it's amazing. Uh, so you can do it. Don't get me wrong, you can. However, it's a big old army you look it's a big old battle to be fair you look at i mean we, we, so we're looking at doing linny as an example and we're already thinking well we may have to push it off to next year because we just don't have the figures for it we need a lot of prussians we need a lot of french the hundred days campaign after all is a big old i mean they're big armies they're not the biggest armies they're not the 1812 invasion of russia size army but they're not small either so they are they they represent a good ambition to get to, but they're not great. If if you want to say right, I want to do the Battle of Waterloo. That's going to be my first war game. You're going to be waiting fifty years before you even ever play a game. Whereas if you went for some of the smaller campaigns, if you're interested in the British, if you said right, I want to do the Battle of Fuentes Donero. It's like a core aside, slightly well less for the British, the ones who are actually engaged on day one, or you could even do day three, which was day two, you know, of the fighting where you only need one division of British and a load of French cavalry. So you've got some smaller battles there that you can really get your teeth into straight away. I mean, the Battle of Arbura would be a brilliant example. What would have happened if it was Duke of Wellington who was in command at Arbura? What would have happened if the French had been more aggressive with their infantry? That kind of thing. So you can do those what-ifs that you get at 100 days, but you can do them on a smaller scale, and that makes it more achievable early on. I also spoke earlier about how great the Battle of Waterloo is because of the number of books that have been written on it. And unfortunately, that becomes a large problem because uh, success breeds success, doesn't it? So if you write a book and you want to set it in the Napoleonic Wars, like, oh, well, you know, my character, he fought in the Napoleonic Wars, he fought in a battle. Okay, well, which battle did he fight in? I mean, you're not going to say, oh, he fought at the Battle of Tiddly Plonk in 1804 that was fought between you know this skirmish for you're not going to worry you're going to be like yeah he fought waterloo it's got an almost mythic quality to it even at the time you got a waterloo medal now you, they did give them peninsula war medals with clasps but they did also give them a specific waterloo medal as opposed to just a campaign one so even at the time it was considered something rather special and i think you know looking back on it now it's got that brand recognition you can set something straight away in 1815 and people know, you know roughly in their their mind they kind of know what's going on and finally and this is i think i'm going to save the uh, the most important one for last i did it in the uh, the first part so i'm going to save it here as well the problem i have with wargaming the 100 days campaign is that it's all just a little bit pointless now you can say to yourself well you know i'm going to rewrite history wellington is going to be defeated at the battle of waterloo and napoleon's going to march on to brussels fantastic Two weeks later, the Russian army is going to descend on Napoleon. That's going to be the end of Napoleon. So, ultimately, you can say, oh, yeah, you know, I've made this, this earth-shattering difference. Napoleon has won the Battle of Waterloo. All it would mean is that a few weeks later, there would be, you'd fight the Russians, and there is absolutely no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the Russians would have absolutely wiped the floor with him. They had him vastly outnumbered. They were a lot more experienced than the Army of the North. 
the commanders were at the top of their game. I just can't see any world in which the French army of 1815 would have beaten the Russian army of 1815. And we've not even gone on to the massive manpower of the Austrian army as well. So realistically, you can say, yeah, you know, we've, we've got created this great change in history, but I'm not sure it would have made a huge amount of difference. The Napoleon probably would have made peace overtures to the Allies, but I can't imagine the Tsar really accepting those. I think it would have been a fairly swift end to it. It may have been the 200 days campaign. Although, having said that, at least if that happened and you've got a Russian army, you'd be able to get involved. <laughs> so I suppose there's that bonus as well. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Now, I should say that this is a very positive channel. And this video has been done tongue-in-cheek, especially my mid-video rant. It is all tongue-in-cheek. I absolutely love the 100 Days campaign. As you know, I recently took part in the Battle of Catra Bra, large game. That's the second time I've done that. I've played the great game. So I, I am well-versed in the 100 Days campaign. And the next one, it was my proposal that we do the Battle of Linny, just to follow on from Catra Bra. So I'm not in any way down on the 100 Days campaign. But I, I hope people out there look at the different campaigns and look beyond Waterloo and see that there are other interesting battles and other interesting campaigns out there with more interesting troops, more interesting characters, and just more drama. Well, actually, I say more drama, probably not more drama than the Waterloo campaign. It's pretty dramatic. But different levels of drama going through. That's, that's all I'm asking, really, is nothing wrong with the 100 Days campaign. But there are other campaigns available, shall we say. Please leave your comments down below about why the Battle of Waterloo and the 100 Days as a war game sucks. But, <laughs> joking aside, please be positive. Remember, there are going to be people who all they know about the Napoleonic Wars is the Battle of Waterloo. And that's absolutely fine. That's fantastic. I'd much rather we had people who wanted to play the Battle of Waterloo or the 100 Days campaign and felt supported in that than people who like, just felt that they weren't allowed to play that and so just never got into the hobby at all. So tell me in the comments why the Battle of Waterloo sucks, but please be positive. Let's have it all tongue-in-cheek. Let's enjoy the different aspects of Napoleonic Wargaming, and I'll see you guys next time.